And I was like, all right, well, it was put in place by uh, Bahamut. And so now we need to find a way to get this information from Bahamut. <laughs> now we got to call Bahamut and be like, hey, we uh, we tried to get this information from your Sphinx. Total dick, by the way. Uh, tried to kill us. <laughs> I guess we didn't know the answer to his question. I don't know. Either way, could you help us? Because, like, man, that was annoying. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Maybe maybe the DM's like, yeah, I'm going to make Bahamut total total bro. And he's like, oh, that Sphinx, I hired him, and he made his own riddles. I don't know the answer. To you won't tell me what the thing is. Uh, Fuck that guy. Welcome to Monsters and Multiclass, your Dungeons & Dragons fix. I'm Kevin Odie. I'm Jared Bornigal. And I'm Will Milton. And we'll be hanging out with you for a while to talk about anything and everything D&D related. This episode, we're taking a look at the Bard Fighter Multiclass, the Sphinxes from the Monster Manual, and then another segment of Ask Monsters and Multiclass. So pull up a chair and stick around for a while. As usual, first things first is our multiclass. Uh, today we're looking at the Bard Fighter the bard is the full charisma caster, the orator, the musician, the inspirer. The fighter is a highly trained warrior, surpassing any normal soldier. Requirements to multi-class for this is 13 strength or dexterity for fighter, and then 13 charisma for bards. Uh, so let's go ahead and get first thoughts out of the way. Kevin, how are you feeling about this multi-class? So with pretty much all fighter multi-classes, it ends up working out really nice, and I don't think this is any exception. Um, there's a couple about this one which makes me like it a lot, though, because the bard kind of fits in that role where it could be a more caster or more martial, and if you go the martial route, like picking like sword bard or something, you end up giving up on some of the really good caster stuff. This could, There's a lot of different ways now where you can multi-class in the fighter, get the martial abilities in there while still being able to be full caster and taking advantage of some of the other cool bard stuff. So I'm excited to discuss this one. I think we're going to see a lot of issues with trying to get the uh, best of both martial sides. Uh, it seems to me that if we like go into the valor or the swords bards, it seems like, oh yeah, they're both martial, so it's just going to work out better. But I worry that they're actually going to step on each other, and I think we'll we'll get more into the mechanics on that later. But I could see that being like a big trap that people might fall into. Uh, Will, how are you feeling about this one? Yeah, like like you said, the uh, I almost feel bad. This is one example of you have two subclasses trying to compete with the multi-class, and I think both kind of get blown out of the water. So it's just like, oh, that content's dumb, just multi-class. <laughs> Flavor-wise, it fits as well as it possibly could. I think it's another problem where any flavor you might have had from the College of Swords or the College of Valor could just be translated into fighter training. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And I, I think that, you know, the challenge is to take it a little bit further uh, role-playing-wise. It, it can be difficult to... It can be difficult to try when you're going into fighter. You can just be like, yeah, you know, I fight, so fighter. But if you can put some like actual backstory to it, it's uh, always, you know, a lot more interesting. Yeah, I think we, we talked about this in a really early episode, but worth bringing up again with if you don't just hand wave it away where, oh, yeah, I'm just good at fighting. So I'll uh, multi-class into fighter and actually do try and justify it. It's a really hard class to actually justify multi-classing into because it requires an immense amount of training you become proficient in every single weapon and fighting in any type of armor and all that's supposed to reflect like years and years of training and dedication to this craft to then to be a bard who then just like or any class who just picks it up after a dungeon it's like ah it, it's like I, I understand if you want to do it that way but it is a little hand wavy so in the in the same way that somebody says, oh, yeah, I bought a, a pan flute and I started practicing it. So now I'm a bard. It's like, well, no, there's kind of a lot more to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's very true, too. The other way. Bard is another one where it's it's not just something you just have. It's not like a warlock where even though we always kind of gush over the RP ramifications of multi-class and in the warlock, it can happen overnight where you make a deal for patron um, or like sorcerer or something. But yeah. Bards, fighters, wizards, they all take a lot of practice and training. They have the advantage of being entirely magical, though, in their nature, so you can just be, I don't have to explain shit about it. For what? 
for any even wizards a little bit but they're like explicit about it but a bard's like oh i just got so good at the pan flute that now i'm magically good at the pan flute whereas (laughs) fighters it's like i mean we have that in the real world you can train to be a fighter in the real world it takes for fucking ever it does um with bards to be fair it's more about they see the the fabric of creation there's within its fluff text at the beginning of the class it talks about the belief amongst the bards as the world was like almost sung into existence or something along those lines and the echo of that is still heard today and so they tap into that and that's where their magic comes from so they're delvers of ancient lore and stuff like that I bet every class thinks that, though. Just like, oh, yeah, you know, bards think that the world was sung into existence. Wizards think that it was some arcane uh, startup. And druids, it's all about Mother Nature. And, I don't know, barbarians just raged the earth into existence. (laughs) Someone got so angry, the earth just, like, (laughs) popped out. I'm going to make a place where people just live to work and die and just repeats forever. You know, just normal anger stuff. (laughs) Um, overall, though, this has to be one of the, the easier requirements to multi-class into that we've seen in a while. Bards very often will go down the road of dexterity as a secondary skill. Uh, mm-hmm. But I do think there's actually something interesting to trying to go into a strength bard here. Just because the best part of fighter is that it gives you heavy armor. At least if you start your class in there. So if you go from fighter into bard... You, you already come in with your heavy armor proficiency, whereas if you start as a bard, go to fighter, you only get medium armor. It's not like I see people complaining all the time that bards have bad AC or anything. I mean, they can get medium armor and that's fine. But being able to get heavy armor is always a positive in my eyes. Light armor. Bards are light armor unless they go one of the You're two right. subclasses that get it. You are correct. Okay, so then that's that can be really big, especially if you're going one of those full caster ones. So starting in again, that that fighter and then switching over to Bard, you're really not losing too much. You get like a couple of you get a single proficiency and then a a musical instrument proficiency, I think, for going into Bard. The medium armor proficiency obviously doesn't matter. I could very easily see just going straight into strength and maybe not paying as much attention to dexterity, uh, which is a little different than a normal Bard. Yeah, for sure. There's it's. As far as I know, I don't think there's really anything within bar that that benefits from high dexterity. You know, like with rogue, they have to be using finesse weapons, so it's dex based, and they really need dexterity, strength based. Rogue's kind of little iffy, kind of silly. With the bard, flavor wise, it feels like it should be dexterous. They should be dexterous, but I, I don't. Know, I feel like I'm forgetting something. College of swords. Um, I mean, yeah, you have dueling and two weapon fighting, which could be easily strength based for both of them. Yeah, and then in terms of like the blade flourishes, the defensive flourish, slashing flourish, and mobile flourish, dexterity does not come into play at all. Yeah, so dex is pretty, I mean, not unimportant. It's just, it's not necessary at all. Um, right. Now, what is very necessary is charisma. That plays a huge, huge part in bards. And when you're trying to mix that with a martial class, it just makes it a little bit difficult. I mean, not anything worse than you've seen from other multi-classes. Uh, I think one of the nice parts of going into fighter in this case is that fighters get so many ASIs that you might actually be able to catch up and you know have a good strength score and a good charisma and a good constitution. Well, that's if you keep taking levels in fighter, but then you're not really multi-classing. If you take any more levels in fighter, you're not multi-classing. That's a big <laughs> well, statement, Kevin. <laughs> No, that was not what I'm saying. It, <laughs> fighters get a lot of ASIs if you are only a fighter. If you're not, if you go four levels into fighter, you get the same amount as anyone else. Right. Right. And that's why I still think I, I don't see a reason, or at least a huge reason, to do the you know College of Swords or College of Valor. Because at sixth level for both of those subclasses, you're going to get extra attack. And for fighter, fifth level, obviously you get extra attack as well. Uh, so mm-hmm. the nice thing about going into lore, bo- lore Bard or College of Whispers or are there any others? Doesn't matter. But the nice part about going into those is that you're not really limited then in how many fighter levels you take. So you can chase those ASIs and anything else you want to. Uh, you're obviously holding back your spell progression, but 
bards get so much outside of spells that depending on what play style you're going for, which in this case it's it's melee. I mean, that's what you're opening yourself up to. Uh, the spells can just be some nice little sprinklings. You say that, but in practice, like if you look at the class, it is technically speaking a full caster. In practice, that's not true. But you a look bard? at the thing. Yeah. How is it not a full caster in practice? It's just, it's not, Kevin. You know this. <laughs> is it because it's not a warlock? Yeah, obviously, the warlock is the full caster. Everything else, it's like a two-thirds caster. I just, I want to know what what your <laughs> classification is for a full caster, because I think it's just wizards and warlocks, right? No, it's just warlocks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was doing some theory math on this to justify it, and like, as far as average spell level cast... They are the fullest spellcaster. Okay. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. I don't think so either. But, uh, you know... No, let's... they are, because they they all every spell they cast is at 5th level at level 20. Right. Okay. But how many spell slots do they even have? Like, 3 or 4? Yes, and you average that to get the answer, you stupid idiot. <laughs> Alright, we'll, we'll do the math later, but <laughs> I think this is kind of bullshit. The... No, it works out. I mean, don't doesn't a twentieth level wizard? Do they get only one ninth, one eighth, like two sevenths, maybe? That already is like skewing this a lot. Yeah, but mm-hmm. uh, warlocks get one each. <laughs> All right, you're right. I'm they do. It. It. It, it, you're right. But uh, but also, why right. why is average spell level cast what matters? It doesn't because wizards doesn't have so many more spells. You're just feeding into it, Kevin. Don't All right. don't. All right. <laughs> You guys are just mad because you finally realize that I'm right. Uh, <laughs> but in practice, we're talking about a caster that's got just like a huge amount of daily spells that are, especially if you go lower, ridiculously powerful. Yeah. So mm-hmm. the extras you get with Bard, they're great, but they really, you would be very dumb to sit on your spell casting as like a added sprinkling of fun. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. It's kind of the core of the class. So then I guess what, to me, it does is it allows you to go down Bard to, you know, whatever path you want or extent you want, and then, you know, continue on with Fighter once again for maybe further down. Like, you're already, you know, level 8 in Bard and level 3 in Fighter, and it's like, eh, you know, I guess I'm going to keep going Fighter. Or maybe 5 so that you get your extra attacks. But you're not limited, at least, and you can still get everything that the later level fighters get. Depending on how far this campaign's going up to, that might not be worthwhile, just because a lot of times, like, level 7 in fighter isn't really that impressive most of the time. It's, like, one of their weaker uh, subclass features. So I don't see people saying, like, oh, go to 7th level fighter just to stop there. But 6 for the second ASI, it's at least an option. Mm-hmm. To talk more specifics, there's always, of course, the classic three-level dip in the fighter, which basically anybody's going to benefit from. So you're barred, taking three levels in the fighter, or let's say you start as a fighter. So you get heavy armor, proficiency of all weapons, you get a fighting style, second wind, action surge, and then what, whichever subclass you go. If you go battle master, you go, you get some bunch of maneuvers and stuff like that, champion extra crits. I don't know why you want to do that. Cavalier, you get the Cavalier Mark thing. To, of course, people attack you in your heavy armor. Uh, and then especially if you go going that route, if in Bard, you're lower Bard, you also then have cutting words. So you could use the Cavalier's, I think it's Unwavering Mark, I think it's called, I don't have it yeah. up in front of me. You're right. Where if they, yeah, if they attack anyone but you, they get disadvantage. So it really incentivizes people to attack you. So you're standing there in heavy armor, and then you're a lore bard of cutting words, which you can then use to lessen their high rolls anyways. So it's actually kind of a decent way to tank. Yeah, that's a good point. Counterpoint, every time I have concentration and I get hit, it breaks. Okay, well, uh, that's that. Then. I don't think it's, any it's, of that stuff requires concentration. No, he's saying that no, because we were you will be... The spell casts. Right, since you'll be oh. concentrating as a bard, you might not want to be just taking hits and focusing attacks on you. They're, yeah. they're less heavy on it than, like, druids. I remember... 
my bard spell list, I was like, wow, there's so much concentration on this list. I can't cast anything. And then I started playing a full level druid, and I'm like, all right, there was almost no concentration spells <laughs> on the bard list. <laughs> Everything on my druid list is concentration. Yeah, and I mean, the I guess it makes sense for the druid. They get tons of battlefield control and things that are good to concentrate on. But that's besides the point for bards. I mean, you could still, especially lore bard, give yourself shield. So, I mean, that's a way to prevent yourself from getting hit in the first place. And I think the point of unwavering mark, though it seems like it's to focus attacks on you, it's really to make attacks on everyone else worse. And unless what you are fighting is intelligent enough to pick up on that, a lot of times you're just giving disadvantage on most of its attacks. I, I don't know if I would say the creature needs to be intelligent to pick up on it. I think the it's implied that they're aware they're going to struggle to hit anybody but you. Like, almost as, I, th- I think the intent is the mark you put on them kind of distracts them. And the idea is it's supposed to draw focus to the cavalier. And so I, I would automatically, even like a just a beast with one or two intelligence, just instinctually understand that if the, if I don't attack this, this cavalier, that I will have trouble hitting anything else. I, I don't think it's supposed to be like a beguiling trick. You could do that in real life if... All three of us were in like a chimpanzee exhibit <laughs> in some freak kind of chimpanzee. <laughs> I already like accident. where this metaphor is going. Please keep continuing. You know, we could make we could convince t- Kevin to tank the chimpanzee, <laughs> and the chimpanzee would attack him. You just have to threaten it, right? Right. Make myself seem like the more immediate threat. It's like, oh, I get in your way over here, and yeah, make fun of how they talk. <laughs> And they're like, that's not how I sound. And they just come right at you. Right, yeah. Show a bunch of teeth. Yeah. Yeah, how that would work on like a gelatinous ooze, I'm more mixed on. <laughs> it's like pushing the limits of what they are capable of. Yeah. that's For, for something like an ooze. Okay, but uh, that's a really special case. Oozes are like the dumbest of the dumb. They're They're like barely alive. Caustic jello. They're, they're, they're like alive in the sense like plants are alive. They just kind of react to stimuli, end of it. Yeah, well, one thing, though, about Unwavering Mark that kind of sucks for this mix is that it does uh, rely on your strength modifier because you can... Well, I guess not entirely. That's for the special attack. Okay, so for Unwavering Mark, you can set that mark as a bonus action, I believe, whenever you want for as many times as you want. But then it's if they attack somebody else, you get to make that special attack where you just get like an additional melee weapon attack and that you can do up to your strength modifier. So I guess there's some reasons to go into uh, strength further and you might not want to do this with like a dex build, for example. Right. But it also isn't entirely necessary. The the extra attack is nice, but it it feels a lot like the was it the war cleric where it's like, oh, every once in a while you can use a, a bonus action to get another attack. And it's like, yeah, it's not really that worthwhile. Yeah. Isn't that their um, divine whatever, whatever? Their channel divinity? I can never remember. That's it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can never remember the name of it. That's so terrible. Especially yeah. with the life cleric, their channel divinity is like, just like fix every problem on the battlefield <laughs> twice a day. Right. War cleric, get an extra attack. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> 1d8 plus whatever damage, that really has saved the day. Thank you, War Cleric. If it hits. If it hits. So that's kind of how that, you know, unwavering mark feels as well. If you have the strength and you can do this, you know, five times per long rest, cool. But if you can't, at least you can still get the uh, unwavering mark and use that as many times as you need. Okay, and that, that happens not on a bonus action, I apologize. It's when you hit a creature with a melee weapon attack, then you can mark them until the end of your next turn. So it really doesn't last uh, that okay. long. Okay, you, you need to keep hitting, right? Yeah. Okay. The real quick correction, just because we were talking about it, The uh, for the War Cleric, their first level is War Priest. Up to their Wisdom modifier, they can make an extra attack as a bonus action. That's what it is. Oh, now it's we a good were talking class. About it. It's no, all I was just correcting a mistake we made, so misinformation's not out there. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Your service is appreciated. You're welcome, Jared. <laughs> As for uh, to, to think of a subclass from the bard side beyond lore that I would really like with this is College of Whispers. 
Uh, College of Whispers' big thing is that they can expend their bardic inspiration die to basically do a mind smite. Uh, they do 2d8, I believe, damage. Six. 2d6. Six. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, on a hit, they can expend, use their bardic inspiration, deal an extra 2d6 psychic damage to their target. Uh, they can only do that once per round, but it does go up to 3d6 at 5th level, uh, 5d6 at 10th level, and 8d6 at 15th level. So mixing that with a fighter seems just like a, an obvious combination to me from a mechanic standpoint. And I really like the idea of Cavalier still as the subclass, mainly because a lot of the fighter subclasses, I just feel like don't have that much flavor to them, or at least One's like Echo Knight doesn't really mix well with Bard because one, you're going to have the intelligence and charisma necessary components there, but also it just like doesn't really make that much sense. Uh, whereas something like Cavalier is all about a a nobleman, basically uh, somebody who is a refined fighter. And I think that pairs very well, not just with Bard, but with that College of Whispers. Uh, so I particularly like the idea of like a a noble person who has you know, spent their entire life training and basically gets tired of dealing with the squabblings of other nobles. And they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm tired of fighting other people's wars. And so they get the right contact who's like, yeah, come with us and you know, we'll wipe your past clean and give you this, this new role in our you know, College of Whispers, which is generally a kind of secret society type deal. Uh, and then they learn the ways of the the whispers and <laughs> beyond the uh, what is it? The, the psychic blades that they get that lets them mind smite. Uh, they also get the words of terror at third level, which is probably one of my favorite flavor abilities that in the right campaign can just shine so much basically lets you talk to, or if you speak to a humanoid alone for a minute, then you can attempt to seed paranoia in their mind and you can make them make a wisdom save and frighten them. And if they're frightened, they basically, or if you fail, they don't even know that you tried to do it. So I've always loved that ability because I feel like in the right mm-hmm. hands, it could be very, very dangerous. For sure. Yeah, it's, it's very flavorful too. It's kind of more like you uh, yank someone away from their group and like push, shove them into a back alley and just say really mean things to them for a minute. <laughs> To threaten them. Hey, stupid idiot. You're a stupid idiot. You're dumb and I hate you. But magic makes so they're afraid. As a DM, I'm going to set a timer and say, you have to speak for a minute straight. And if that doesn't hit 60 <laughs> seconds, I'm not giving you the uh, not giving you the, the role here. All right. Well, are you up for the challenge? Hmm? Are you up for the challenge? We have like an hour and 40 minute podcast here. I think we can no, dedicate I'm the a minute guy on to the scene of Will. Why would you make me do it? <laughs> stupid idiot. <laughs> yeah he's up to the challenge yeah the one thing that this, i always kind of wonder is though man. is like you know it, it it makes a target frightened of you and i always try and think like what's really the benefit of that and the number one thing i see is that when somebody's frightened they have disadvantage on all ability checks and attack rolls while the source of its fear is within line of sight the disadvantage on ability checks from a role-playing perspective seems extremely beneficial but i'm trying to wonder how is it beneficial from a player's perspective? I could very easily see as a DM and an NPC doing this to one of you all would be really detrimental. Uh, Cause then mm-hmm. they, you know, you can't pass deception checks or whatever you're trying to do. But from the other way around, it's, I wonder how you'd really play that out as a DM. The deception one's the obvious one, but the second obvious one that you're just like, I don't know why you're missing this is say you've got, <laughs> A wrestling match the next day. Yes. Or the Nicest next guy on the podcast. I don't know why you're missing this obvious thing, Jared. Jeez, you're so <laughs> fucking dumb. So yeah, Nicest you've got a wrestling podcast. match, you know, <laughs> right up. So you're talking to your opponent, you know, right before the match. He now has disadvantage on grapple checks. Okay. That's, maybe it's I missed true, that yeah? because that's very specific. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> um, but you're right. Anytime so, you, Go ahead, Kevin. I would... I, I would look at the benefit as being less mechanical. I mean, obviously, it does have the mechanical benefits of the frightened condition, but they're frightened of you for an hour, and that's kind of a vague thing. And I would, I say, it would make it easier for 
the bard and the party in general would probably intimidate this person, bully them, that sort of thing, into doing what they want, that sort of stuff. Uh, where I think that's mainly where the main benefit would come in. More more from the role playing, from the softer side of things. I think what I would rather from a mechanical standpoint, because I totally agree with what you're saying, and that's honestly how I would run it. I feel like it would make more sense if they were charmed for an hour so that all of your roles had advantage instead of their roles having disadvantage. From a purely mechanical standpoint, that would mean your persuasion checks have advantage, your intimidation, your insight, your whatever all have advantage instead of them having disadvantage on things. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, I, I would just roll that they get advantage on intimidation checks with the frightened. I'm with you. Just or across the board. Yeah, if you frighten someone, you have advantage on intimidation checks. I don't think it's written anywhere, but... Does it even need to be advantage, or is it just like you win? You get... You intimidate them? It depends what you're asking. Okay, fair. Also, if you're... Like, if you were proficient, I'd give it to them. Yeah. You know, someone could be afraid, but brave, and not... Like, you're asking them to b- betray their values and their friends and family, and they're terrified of you, but, you know, they kind of stuttering and shakingly stand up to you anyways, you know. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, so the sixth level of College of Whispers is also Mantle of Whispers. That's the one where if you kill somebody, you could assume you could look like them. I loved that as with the Rogue Bard, yep. where we uh, talked about that in depth. Um, with Fighter Bard, I, I don't know if that fits... Is well, but with, with the character idea you just gave about the noble who abandons their society to join the College of Whispers to do shady shit. I mean, it fits, especially if they were like kind of a dex-based fighter soldier before. No, they are they were a mounted combat soldier before, and they're a mounted combat uh, bard now. I'm not changing that. <laughs> <laughs> That's my least favorite part about Cavalier, and we bring it up all the time because it's mechanically great and interesting, but like the core of it is you ride on a horse. Which is not great and not interesting. <laughs> and you don't have to, though. because Ed... I know, but the core of it is. At any level, I'm pretty sure at any level, when you get an ability that impacts you being mounted, you also get an ability that has nothing to do with it. Yes, because... because and they did this because that's how the game works. You don't ride on a horse all day long. They, like, they right. knew this was coming. But they still made a class where the core defining feature is you ride on a horse really well. Also, here's a bunch of more important mechanical stuff that has nothing to do with the horse. That's true. We did completely pass over the Cavalier's born to saddle ability. Because it's it's like we keep saying, oh, you don't have to. I know, but it's just like born to it's it's so there. (laughs) It's 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 pretty so horse based. This guy would have horse stuff, like, embroidered on his clothes. Yeah. And I, and I don't think that, I mean, you, what you said about, like, realistically speaking, you're just not going to be on a horse for most of the time. That's totally right. Uh, I still think, though, that this, with the character concept I had in mind, I am totally fine with them also always having a horse and being a, a horse rider. It, when we a talk, horse assassin. Oh, he's, why does he have to be an assassin in the way that you're thinking of, like infiltration? It's not always I've been about struggling to find jobs. Turns out not a whole lot of people need horses killed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to me, it's not about sneaking in in the middle of the night. It's about getting information. Maybe it's about uh, right, you know yeah. tons of other things beyond sneaking in and killing somebody in the middle of the night. That's what the yeah. rogue bard is for this guy he is the the one who can talk with the you know the the kings as well as he can talk with no mostly just the the kings everybody else disgusts him that's that's (laughs) canon now (laughs) right (laughs) yeah i mean college whispers is about infiltration it just may not be in the physical sense of sneaking in you could still be infiltrating based on guile and wits and persuasion and manipulation but it's still infiltration i got it here's a hook here's a hook for all you dms out there he needs to infiltrate a horse club. I was about to Ooh. say, this is just the plot to the Fast and the Furious. <laughs> 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 but just for horse riding? Yeah, a Cavalier College of Whispers is the build for uh, Paul What's-His-Face from <laughs> Paul Fast Walker? and the Furious. <laughs> so we do like the Batman build. This is the, yeah, this is the guy with the hair from uh, Fast and Furious. Compared to the, the one without the hair. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there was two characters. Right. The guy without the hair and the guy with the hair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Another thing with 
And like kind of a twist on what you were talking about here. Samurai in College of Whispers could work well for that same type of character. The noble warrior that uh, joins the College of Whispers for underhanded things and infiltration and all that. Uh, and with the samurai, they actually get ability. They get bonuses to persuasion and stuff like that. And then that can, they could kind of do both sides of it where like the commoners and royalty. For what it's worth, Cavalier also can take performance and persuasion as uh, proficiencies. Yeah, now Samurai actually gets a, what is it, Elegant Courtier at 7th. Uh, whenever right. you make a persuasion check, you gain bonus to the check equal to your wisdom. So I mean, all right, you got to add wisdom on top of it. Right. <clears throat> and that's something... And go to seven. Okay, actually, I'm going to hold off on that. What I want to hear is, how do you guys think of a samurai outside of like what a classical samurai is? Because in the same way that Will has a hard time separating Cavalier from the horse, I have a hard time of separating samurai from the you know classic view of what a samurai is. And that is almost difficult... Well, no, that is difficult to fit into most standard medieval settings. Yeah, I mean, you could always do the... Someone from afar visiting. 90% of the issue is because it's called Samurai. If you called it Honor Warrior, would you have the same issue? No. No. All right. Yeah, so it's rife for reskinning based on your setting. No, that's and that's fine with me. That's exactly what I'm asking. Flavor saying it like that of, oh, it's it's a fighter who is obsessed with honor. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Yeah, I mean, I would make the player come up with why, like a, some level of culture behind it. They can't just be like, oh, yes, I'm from a far eastern land where they, uh, that's important. It's like, give me something. You know? Why is your elf like this? And realistically, doesn't work in a lot of people's settings. You can't just say, I'm, I'm from a place that has, you know, this type of culture out of nowhere. I mean, like, you know, just without working with your DM or whatever. The other one that right. we, we literally never talk about for good reason. I really wanted Purple Dragon Knight to work with this multi-class because, I, and I know you're shaking your head already, Purple Dragon Knight, one of the, I think it has a, yeah, a, a different reskinning in the same way that Samurai could be Honor Warrior. It specifically says Banneret is like the generic name for this archetype. So I was like, oh, okay, maybe we can, you know, look into this and ignore all of the normal requirements. And a lot of the focus of the class is same is in line with a bard it's assisting your teammates it's doing things for your allies um but everything sucks like it's just not great rallying cry is its third level ability when you use your second wind feature you can choose up to three creatures within 60 feet of you that are allied with you each one regret regains hp equal to your fighter level provided that they can see or hear you that's Sounds like a good thing in a vacuum, but then you compare it to any other third level fighter ability, and it's horrid. Mm -hmm. Especially, it's not a lot of HP to get higher. Right. It's. I mean, and when you get higher, it's still not a lot still of not, HP. Yeah, a twentieth level character getting twenty HP. Yeah, now, I mean, if that was a, if that wasn't limited to three characters, it would almost kind of make sense. Kind of, but like. like if you were in that weird situation, I, I've said this before, if you had this weird situation where you had a mob of, like, low-level warriors with you, like NPC warriors, there are a couple abilities that are just crazy good for that bizarre and hard-to-play scenario. Nope, I don't agree. And mm -hmm. you know why? Because it restores HP, it doesn't give temp HP. If it was temp HP, I totally agree, but those things probably aren't even going to have a max of 20. We even at lower levels. Let's say you're around level 10 and you have 10 HP, or even level 5. And you, if the DM is doing everything, technically goes unconscious and needs to do that saving throws, and then you're surrounded by a bunch of these bannermen, and this is not banneret specifically, just warriors on a field or whatever, right. and a whole bunch of them are dead, and then you cast this, and then they all pop back up and begin fighting again to get another round in. Okay, that's cool. Or you're in a normal situation where you've got yeah. 10 guys fighting 10 other guys of equal magnitude. It's it's a really flavorful ability that doesn't work at all and will never come up. Right. Yeah. yeah actually, it, it feels like the type of thing you we should see on uh, Monster. Like yeah. The Goblin boss and I think Hop Goblin leadership gets stuff like this. Mm -hmm. And a couple others. I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, it's it's somewhat common on Monster stat blocks for any anything that takes a leadership type position. Either allow them to make an extra attack, which they, 
the uh, banner bannerets here do at level 10 right or give hp or temp hp to those around them but yeah, yeah as i think there's a reason this is really the only s- subclass that does it it works better on monsters than for pcs yeah it's never a good sign you know because they're designed to challenge something and then die right not so much a character character aim yeah so again i was just i was very disappointed that this one didn't work because that ability screams bard fighter to me uh, and everything else that it has i mean it continues on where it you know would normally get proficiency in persuasion at seventh level and your proficiency bonus is doubled for any ability check you make that uses persuasion that on top of the bard's jack of all trades and expertise maybe i mean you could have they probably already have it but right you probably do um but you would have some crazy high persuasion checks now you'd be better off going into that a different way i mean uh, expertise (laughs) yeah i mean expertise already doubles proficiency bonus that's what it does yeah and this would do it again don't would it yes because it's coming from a different source you can't expertise twice on the same skill but because this royal envoy is not expertise mm. it officially can stack it's crazy yeah i'm kidding did you look that up or are you just that's just how D works it's just... i know for, for stuff like ac and stuff it does i i for some reason i there's just a little something in the back of my head saying with pr- proficiency bonuses there's a different rules I, I don't know it's not important the way it's phrased is your proficiency bonus and is doubled so i if you go all the way into seventh level purple <laughs> dragon knight to get an extra like plus five on persuasion, you know, go for it, buddy. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's what it comes down to for me. If for some reason somebody did want to use this, and Kevin, you found a ruling that said no, that's not actually okay. I, I think I'd and somebody said no, I want to play this. I want to play this so bad. Uh, I want to have plus fifteen to my persuasion rolls. It's like okay. I guess if that's the character you really <laughs> want to play, then let's ignore it this time. Yeah. And that's when you need to sit down with them and remind them of their expect, temper their expectations that persuasion is not mind control. Yes. Yeah. This, it's not a, the speech stat in a crappily written RPG where you could just make people do whatever you want. Just end the quest. First, first dialogue. Right. I love that subversion breaking <laughs> expectation. <laughs> ah, whatever that would be. It's cool, because if you've got high enough speed, you can just skip the quest. It's like, wow. <laughs> I love not playing the well, game. Yeah, what fun. <laughs> Makes a good second um, one. Yeah. Which is terrible for D&D. Never reruns those <laughs> in D&D. There's just so little reason to do it. Right. All right. Uh, I want to circle back to Echo Knight. You mentioned that thing and it doesn't work. No, I did not. I said Eldritch Knight. Or if I said oh, Echo I Knight, said Echo. I might have misspoke if I said oh. Echo Knight. Okay, I agree with you. Eldritch Knight's probably no good. You're overlapping on spells and trying to fight with intelligence and whatnot. Before we go any further, I just want to yell about and have it recorded that fuck Wizards of the Coast for making two fighter subclasses that are now EK. Because I've always used EK to mean Eldritch Knight, and now Echo Knight has the exact (laughs) same abbreviation, and it's been pissing me off for months now. How dare they? Anyways, well, continue on. To quit D and D throughout the podcast and pick up a new system. <laughs> to Pathfinder. <laughs> Anyways, continue on. All right, okay. All right. I, I think you did say Echo Knight earlier, but I, so okay. Yeah, I agree with Eldritch Knight. Uh, Echo Knight. I like the idea of just because the they have a feeling of being the kind of beguiling trickster uh, fighters on the battlefield, and that fits really well with Bard. They already have magical type stuff infused in with them and then bard just kind of takes that to the next level yeah i can see it definitely and they just i mean the echo is just good this is one of those subclasses that anytime it comes up mechanically i feel like it's just going to be like yeah that is worthwhile to take three levels in fighter four yeah just even just flat out the ability to use a bonus action to swap places with your echo is Mm -hmm. good enough and everything else on top of it being able to attack from them taking opportunity attacks with them that's just that's just icing right definitely and in in terms of role-playing reasons if you really want to fully go into the it's pronounced dunamis right yes yeah with that based on what i've read out a little bit on the lore it sounds like a lot of the the secrets of dunamis is around um 
kind of secret societies and things like that. It's kind of protected type magic. H- having Echo-, Echo Knight, who's a studier of that and part of those organizations or societies, who's also then a bard. Their idea is they're going out to recruit people for this. Yeah, it would definitely work well with Lore Bard. Mm-hmm. Just that idea of like a, a secret keeper, you know, as, as a whole. Right. I really like that. For sure. Um, let's see. See, there's a lot. There's a lot that works. There's not a lot that doesn't work. Say, the only thing yeah. that I don't like is going far into College of Swords or College of Valor. I just don't feel like it's necessary. You get everything you need for that from Fighter. I would rather go three into Battlemaster than into College of Swords. And because the blade forces are nice, but everything you get from Battlemaster is so much better and doesn't rely on your Bardic Inspiration die. Yeah, I agree. Both Swords and Valor are just kind of made obsolete with this. Valor especially, because I feel like there was a bad design choice made at some point when uh, College of Swords came out. Because I feel like even that by itself just sort of trumps College of Valor. They're both the sort of melee martial focused bard. And when the player, when it was just the player handbook and you had College of Valor, Valor and College of Lore. And that was it. And the lore were the caster bards and the valor were the martial parts. And that worked fine because then if you went College of Valor, you got medium armor, shields, and martial weapon proficiency. And then you got that combat inspiration where you could add just damage rolls and stuff like that and extra attack at sixth level. Then here comes College of Swords and a new book coming out. And you also get, yeah, medium armor. Um, you don't get in shield. You don't get all martial weapons, but... How many do you need? <laughs> oh, I guess you just get Simtar. For College of Medium Swords? Armor. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, so you do not get shields either. Oh, that is actually kind of important. Um, yeah, yeah. But then you get the fighting style, which I think blows their their level ability out of the water. You still get six level extra attack, all that sort of stuff. And then all that gets blown out of the water with just multi-classing into fighter. Yeah. Because then you still get the medium armor, the all martial weapons, a fighting style of any choice. So you can still pick the fighting styles you get as College of Swords if you want. Uh, action surge, second wind, go three levels to Battlemaster, and you get significantly more maneuvers than you do blade flourishes. Right. You get to yeah, use just, more, I think. Actually, how many does Battlemaster give you? I think they get four. Four yes. dice. Yep, four uses. It's four not tied dice. to your charisma like Bardic Inspiration is. It doesn't have another use like Bardic Inspiration does. Right. So, overall, I mean... I I haven't brought up Battlemaster much yet because it's just such an obvious pick that it's almost uninteresting to me. Yeah, stop talking about <laughs> Battlemaster. You know I don't like Battlemasters. It's good. It's just good. I know that's why I don't like them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's it's worth noting that like you you look at like uh, College of Valor and College of Swords, it can kind of go back and forth whether like College of Swords just blew Valor out of relevance. But if you ask, like, why do these things exist, it's also kind of important to remember multiclassing is an optional rule. So, you know, Mm -hmm. they do have to balance the game around that not existing. Like, pretend multiclass doesn't exist. All right. There's your option right there. So there's a lot of content in there that is kind of outmoded by literally everything we talk about. Very true. (laughs) I wonder if that's... I I wonder if they do completely ignore multi-classing around balance? I mean, that doesn't seem right, because for every single no, they UA... Don't. I know for a fact they don't. Okay. I say, because every single UA says, like, hey, this isn't fully tested for uh, for your uh, multi-classing, so don't. They balance around that. But they do, I mean, they'll make content that, like, it seems to ignore it, kind of like this, and the reason is, you know, it is an optional rule, so... And more importantly, the the reason why you would go into College of Swords or College of Valor is because you want a more melee-focused bard, but you don't want to slow down your spell slot progression, or you don't want to deal with multiclassing. Spell slot progression is a really good point that I forgot about. It, yeah, if you go in those, it does not slow down spell slot progression at all. Where if you multiclass into fighter, completely halts it. So th- that's actually enough of a reason to not do it. So it just depends if you're willing to give up Spell class, spell cast progression. So I'm glad you brought that up because that's pretty critical. Yeah, and I think most of the time, because you know, due to this show, I just really enjoy multiclassing now. Surprise, surprise. I would be fine with it, but you know, a lot of people do just want to play that 
full spellcasting bard, you're not going to get that here. You're, you're going to be martial focused. And as I said way earlier here, the spell casting is going to be useful. You're going to be using it a lot, but it isn't going to be your main focus compared to swinging and hitting and doing damage. Right. And you also slow down magical secrets. Right. Which is really great. All bards get that at 10th level where they could pick two spells from any spell list, not just the bard, which is really awesome and very powerful. If you go... One benefit, though, of multi-class and into fighter, if you go lower bard, they get additional magical secrets at 6th level. And so you can then get to that while still being martial, or if you go swords or valor, you don't get the additional magical secrets. So just a way to keep that stuff. Yeah, that's you make a very good point. Like uh, That and cutting words, I think, are... We, <laughs> Every single bard at our table is always a friggin' lore bard. <laughs> no, so, they're like, so good. Lore bard battle master. Just, all right, fuck it. It's you win. Lore bard battle right, yeah, master. yeah, that's the answer. I mean, if you roll anything else, you're dumb. <laughs> Nicest man on the podcast. Yeah. Are we doing nice superlatives? Nice people are honest, Kevin. They don't lie to their listeners and tell them it makes sense to do anything other than a lore battle master. <laughs> If Eldritch Knight, uh, I know we don't normally do the whole stepping outside of raw thing, so shut me down if you want to. But for Eldritch Knight, if you can, I, I guess, tell me your guys' thoughts on this. If you take away the intelligence and say that that's charisma for Eldritch Knight and, you know, just combine those two. So like, okay, your spellcasting modifier is charisma instead of intelligence. Everything else is the same. I wonder if that really breaks everything i think there are some benefits to the eldritch knight class uh the bonus action to get your weapon into your hand the war magic at seventh level where you can cast a cantrip and then make a weapon attack is as a bonus action is always really good i i don't know and then you're not slowing down your spell uh progression as much it's still slowing it down a ton a lot i mean yeah that's one third so when you get to third level you get to boost it up one right you know, I, 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 if somebody really wanted all of those things, I just wonder if it would blow up the universe if you allowed them to use charisma instead of intelligence. Yes. Oh, well, that's settled. <laughs> my, my, my biggest issue is it's like, like if you did the charisma thing, I would take away the word wizard and all of that and replace it with bard. Right. And then it's useless. And I think that's fair. You know, I, I think to you're right, because then you get two bard cantrips and it's like, well, I've already got the important bard cantrips from when I went bard. Yeah. There's like one. Or you can make it sorcerer. <sighs> don't get those are also charisma casters. I know, but I don't I don't like that either. Yeah. I, I'd be more OK with that. I guess I would. OK, so stepping away from that, then I would like other fighter subclasses that are treated like this third caster for different casters. You know, a sorcerer Eldritch Knight would be kind of cool if it was like specifically tailored around that because wizards get, you know, really good cantrips and they get whatever else. But just basically more than a reflavoring, I'm sure there would be some abilities they could switch around. That would be interesting. Mm-hmm. Wild Magic Knight. Oh, why? oh, I was going to say, yeah, Wild Magic Knight. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you hit somebody with a sword, roll on the Wild Magic Surge table. <laughs> Good luck. The wild Magic Knight Surge table. As you get to level 20, you're just all you're doing is rolling D100s. <laughs> um, Arcane Archer, we haven't talked about at all. We haven't touched it on this one. Yeah, that's all right. It, yeah, it's... If you like the flavor of it, Arcane Archer, I will say it's a very flavorful subclass. We usually kind of crap all over no. it, but it is a very flavorful subclass. I love the flavor. I love a three-level dip, even. I hate going past that. Yeah, yeah, because it stops building up at all. So if you want to be a ranged bard, Arcane Archer might not be a terrible choice. You kind of get some cool flavorful shots out of it, and then you still get all the other stuff of Action Surge and Second Wind. And- but it relies on your intelligence. Oh, it does. Yeah, for your spell save. Now, I've talked about this at length, I think, with Arcane Archer, is there are some arcane shots that are totally worthwhile regardless of the spell save, or I guess save DC, but I probably would stray away from it just because of that. But again, there's the Grasping Arrow, which just does damage, and then it takes them a whole action, even if they you know pass immediately, it takes them a whole action to try and get out of the grasp. And I think... 
piercing arrow or something that just like lets you shoot through people. Uh, so there's a couple that are worthwhile and you don't need the spell save. You can ignore intelligence, but it's there. Cool. Yeah. Any other, any thoughts on Bard Fighter before we move on? I think we covered it. Yeah, I think I'm good. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for listening. Oh, shit. It's too early. Oh, God. <laughs> it's only a third of the podcast. That's our longest segment, so that's not quite true. But It's also our best. I know that's true. I want to do a poll. Like, what do you like know. more, the monsters or the multi-class? Monsters. You're all about the monsters, Will? That's good. I'm not a big fan of multi-class. <laughs> If multi-class was a favorite, do we have to switch around our name, multi-class and monsters? Doesn't roll off the it sounds tongue. Sounds so wrong, yeah. doesn't yeah, it? No. It's out, it's out of order, man. Yeah. Having three syllables as the first word is, I don't know, it's its pompous. Like, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> it's like an upside-down pyramid. It just, like, doesn't... Yeah. Doesn't work. Unless you spin it really fast. All right, so before we move on to our Monster of the Week, let's go ahead and have our promotional minute. So this week's episode is sponsored by Scabbard RPG Campaign Manager and World Building Tool. Scabbard can help even the most disorganized DM put together a fleshed out world and let you spend your time building your world instead of trying to remember minute details. Uh, recently, they've added a proper noun detector. When you save a note of any kind, Scabbard will scan the text and alert you if it finds any proper nouns that you may want to track or expand upon. It saved me tons and tons of time, and I honestly can't recommend Scabbard enough. Beyond the fact that they're sponsoring this episode, I have been using them for the past year now, and I can't even count the amount of times it has saved my butt on uh, remembering something. <laughs> and as players, we get a lot of use out of it, too, because we could we get access to specifically what Jared, the DM, wants us to. And so we could use it to reference previous places we've gone, jog our memory on stuff, and even... And, you could also have players add stuff to it as well if you want to include them in with the world building. So that's been kind of cool. We've been taking advantage of that too. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's a huge benefit when the DM insists on making their own world because you can't go outside their head if they don't have it written down. So if you want information, you're shit out of luck unless they're doing you know official stuff. Yep. Yeah, and, and even recently, as Kevin said, he's been helping me build out the uh, the Burning Lands, which is his character's hometown or home region uh, that I had almost no information on, and it's been really great collaborating. And Scabbard has made that much easier for again you to get information and you to put it down. Um, so. Let's move forward. It's a lot of talk. But right now, our listeners can get an extra month plus 10% off a hero level subscription if you go to scabbard.com forward slash monsters. And I think that goes until June 4th. Uh, so just make sure to jump on that, sign up for a free account and test it out. See how you like it. And uh, yeah, let us know what you think. Uh, and that's scabbard with one B. Don't, don't forget that. Scabbard with one B. And then, of course, if you want to find us, uh, you can find us on Twitter, monsters underscore multi. Go to our subreddit, which is r slash monsters and multiclass. Uh, subscribe to our Patreon, where I've been posting my, my show notes every time we release an episode. Uh, and occasionally we have early episode releases. But for the most part, it's mostly just to support us and say that Thanks. Um, okay, last thing that I have. This is going on for a while. I apologize. Uh, we recently started a merch store as well because we got a new logo that looks absolutely amazing. Uh, if you want to wear things with our logo on it, uh, then there will be links for that. I don't have a short one to say for that. It's it's just a URL that's very long. Find us wherever you can. Leave reviews. Leave reviews. That too. Jeez. Um <laughs> Anything else okay. you want know, to just uh, talk about us longer? I book, I chapter mark all of these promotional minutes. So if you just want to skip forward, if you in your podcast player allows that, then just go right to the monsters one. If you're tired of listening to us talk, if you want to continue hearing the sultry sounds of my voice, then you can just keep this running for as long as you want. Can't even loop it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's move on to the monster of the week. For this episode's monster, we're taking a look at the Sphinxes from the Monster Manual. Specifically, this is the Andrew Sphinx and the Gyno Sphinx. Sphinxes are generally put in place to guard ancient treasures and lore and knowledge and can be a really tough fight if you need to fight them. A lot of cool lore here, spooky riddles and time-shifting shenanigans. 
time shifting shenanigans. Yeah, I said that right. So what do you guys think of the Sphinxes? I think that my immediate gut reaction around Sphinxes is they're very difficult to put in front of players to make into an actual encounter that you are sure they're going to go through. I'm not sure how I think I've used a Sphinx maybe one time and it was basically to like give a riddle that if you guys did not succeed on, then they attacked. Uh, I, after rereading the lore a little bit, it sounds to me like a lot of their purpose is to guard information. That's number one. And two, if somebody needs that information, then they just get to fuck your day up by trying to kill you. And that's like fun for them. <laughs> Where it's like, there's no like, you know, big puzzles or anything as like these barriers. They have tests, but their biggest test is just going to attack you. Did we read the same thing? (laughs) That's what I got out of it. (laughs) See, I got the opposite. This is a lawful neutral neutral character. He just rips things apart for fun. (laughs) Great time. See, I I was reading this thing and like, I'm not sure when you would actually fight them. Because they're, they're either... Yeah, so the divine guardians, they're either like high priests of a celestial entity or they're been like kind of brought in to existence through prayer or whatever, bound to protect a treasure or knowledge or, you know, an ancient important place. Until death, uh, they test those who come through to see who are worthy, either through a series of challenges. They might be giving out quests, you know, oh, to prove your worthiness, go give me the super rare thing or whatever, or give them a bunch of tricky riddles or all of the above. Or, like, bring me a custard pie. Yeah. And, and, and D&D, that might be hard. When one was custard invented <clears throat> before D&D times, I don't know. What the hell's custard? I don't know. The people who hired me made it. <laughs> <laughs> it was yellowish that's all i know and i might have read the lore wrong but i am pretty sure it's saying like if people just attack and kill the sphinx all its knowledge and paths to the treasure it was guarding and everything are lost no you're you're right i'm rereading it right now under the the magical tests uh um, yeah that's it. It is supposed to be that they provide miscellaneous tests, and that's how you get the information. If you fail the test, then it kills you, and that's the part that threw me off. Is it's just like, oh, you failed the test. Well, I'm gonna attack you now. It has the opportunity to just teleport you away and like never allow you to return, but it very specifically says just uh, those who fail a Sphinx test typically meet a gruesome end beneath its claws. Which you know, it's kind of fitting, I guess, if you're some otherworldly powerful entity and you put the sphinx down here in the material plane to protect something there needs to be a consequence to failure or otherwise every fucking person's gonna wander in there and think well let's give it a shot what's the worst that'll happen right and that's that's the important thing the your other option is to walk away and not try and guess the puzzle the giant magical lion <laughs> is giving you. you can just go home this is not like a he doesn't want to kill you if you don't know the answer, go home. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, when's, like, the, the time that you can, like, back out? Like, if it's, like, are you sure you're willing to commit to this test? And you're, like, yes, please. And then it just gives you this riddle. And you're, like, mm, bye. <laughs> <laughs> like, isn't that kind of failing it? Like, if you if you are even at that point, then it's decided already that you're, you're in it. Every Sphinx has learned this. Because, like, the first time this happened... You know, the dudes were like, got it. They walked away and we immediately went to the wizard tower and were like, all right, here's the clip. <laughs> and all the nerds at the wizard tower was like, oh, yeah, well, we'll just spend the day on this and we got it. Right. And the Sphinx was like, oh, son of a bitch. Right. So he doesn't let that happen right. anymore. Right. So he'll warn you, you know, you got to have that. Yeah. Right. It's like, once you hear my riddle, you're committed. Give me an answer, the correct answer, or you die. And so I think that this, this does open up so many doors uh, to use in a dungeon type scenario but also in a larger campaign where the party needs information you know when at some point in a story the party is going to get to something they need to know more well maybe they find out that there is a sphinx somewhere nearby that has that information so now it's a matter of going to the sphinx completing its trial and in that case it can be a little weird just because if it's legitimately important to the campaign that the party completes these trials, then 
I don't know, maybe the trial is less like riddle based and more like what you said, Kevin, of like, okay, now go bring me this and bring me this. And in that case, they're probably not going to fight it at all. And it's just like right. a cool NPC. Exactly. Yeah, it's I, I could see fighting it in, when you're using the kind of design sense of multiple ways forward. You know, right. you, you need information and there's turns out there's multiple ways in the world to get it. The main one, the one that you're clued off on first is go find the Sphinx, answer its riddle, gives you the information. If you fail its riddle or its tests or whatever, you get this really tough fight out of it. And we'll get to the stat blocks in a minute here. And then you have to go find another way to get this information, which the DM better have planned. Otherwise, everything grinds to a halt. But at the same time, out any information that's worthy of having protected by a Sphinx feels like it shouldn't just be floating out there in the world in other ways. It seems like that should be the only way to get it. Otherwise, why even go through the trouble of summoning for the Sphinx to protect this? Well, okay. I mean, that that's going to be very specific on the information, the campaign, and probably a million other things. Uh, but I could see maybe needing to find somebody to you know, contact another plane to get the answer here or contacting okay. a God in some matter that again, that that's just depends on what the setup is in the first place. Uh, that's but I, fair. Agree yeah, I guess if you make it something like it's not so much like the shady rogues guild and you know, the two towns over actually also has this information and they need you to go do some morally questionable things to get it. And the Sphinx was the way around it, but you can't do that. That would be silly, but you're right. If you make it extra planar shenanigans, I could see right. that. Or even... Um, oh, yeah, you have to remember that there is an ability that clerics get to ask God stuff, so you can be like... Basic stuff. Hey, my God, what's the answer to this? Super you know? basic stuff, though. I mean, you can ask them yes or no questions, and they'll be cryptic in their answers. That's not really going to give you the, you know, the world-saving MacGuffin information. Is the world-saving MacGuffin in this town... Next day. <laughs> Just keep going. Stop by every village in the world. No. It's just like the magic conch. <laughs> so then you, you make it, then you have to contact the specific god. And again, sphinxes are often put in place by a god. So you go, you fail the test, you get in a fight, you kill the sphinx, you don't get that information. That was kind of the easy way to do it. Now it's like, all right, well, it was put in place by uh, Bahamut, and so now we need to find a way to get this information from Bahamut. <laughs> now we got to call Bahamut and be like, hey, we uh, we tried to get this information from your Sphinx. Total dick, by the way. Uh, tried to kill us, I guess. We didn't know the answer to his question. I don't know. Either way, could you help us? Because, like, man, that was annoying. <laughs> yeah. You never know. Maybe maybe the DM's like, yeah, I'm going to make Bahamut total total bro and he's like oh that sphinx i hired him and he made his own riddles i don't know the answer <laughs> you tell me what the thing is uh, fuck that guy um I, from a more serious perspective i do like the idea though of the the sphinx being the easier option so either you present a couple of options or that's just the first thing as you said at hand people go they fail have this big old fight. And then from there, it's a matter of finding somebody to help. And maybe you have to go on multiple quests to acquire pieces, to complete a ritual, to contact Bahamut, as you said. And part of that ritual is pleasing Bahamut enough that he's willing to give you some information. Killing 999 chromatic dragons. <laughs> Yes. The DM just throws that out because they, they're they like, all right, I don't want to deal with whatever the players are planning. And they're like, all right, dragon hunting time. Son of a bitch. I don't, I don't fully remember the lore of Bahamut. Is, does he hate other dragons? Is that his thing or is that a different dragon? Or Bahamut's the god of metallic dragons. I think. He's metallic? Yeah. Or he, or no, yeah, he's metallic. And then the Tiamat's Tiamat's chromatic, yeah. Okay, chromatic. so then maybe it is like, oh yeah, just go kill a, a chromatic dragon, bring me its head, and that's part of the ritual. And you're like, wow, I really wish we could have just answered that riddle correctly. Right. Why are we a bunch of dummy dum dums? Right. <laughs> uh, another reason I can see getting Sphinx combat in the game is maybe the big bad evil guy is seeking lore or information that you know this Sphinx has. Mm. And you're pretty sure that they're smart enough to pass its challenges. Oh. So you beat the big bad evil guy to the Sphinx. And you kill the Sphinx to keep it a secret. That's pretty cool. I like that. Yeah. 
That's that doesn't sound like the good guy thing to do. To be honest, it's not. It's definitely a morally gray. <laughs> that's the thing. Fantastic. But I guess the information they get is going to allow the evil guy to like destroy the world or whatever other ridiculous evil plans they have. And so it's like, all right, we go kill the Sphinx and. There are worse things. Plans. I'm, yeah. I'm not going to have like a, it's not like killing a flumph, you know, it's not like, oh, this pure energy of goodness. No, I mean, it's, you know, it's a lawful neutral creature. It's just doing a job. I'm sure that in the afterlife, whatever God put it there is like, oh, let's repurpose you to a different dungeon or whatever. Right. Uh, you know. What if the Sphinx test is your goodness and it teleports <laughs> a flumph in and says, strangle this flumph with your bare hands and then just sits back. Well, then I definitely kill the Sphinx. It's like, no information is worth killing a flumph. But what if the pa- pass in the riddle is refusing to kill the flumph? Hmm. Ooh. So you accidentally pass? You can still kill the Sphinx afterwards. Right? It's like, that was just really mean. Yeah. <laughs> You've passed my test. We're not here for the riddle. We're here to kill you to prevent the riddle from existing. Right. I was on just a different thing, just more classic setup. You find oh. a Sphinx. <laughs> oh, okay. Then that would be a real... I'm just imagining how disappointed they probably would be, just like... Oh, yes, adventurers, for your test. And they're just like, charge! (laughs) Like, finally, I get to give out my riddle. It's been 3,000 years I've been sitting here in this dusty-ass building, and finally somebody appears. Oh, God, they're just going to kill me? (laughs) Look how excited they are for the riddle. They're running right for me. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so that's, I think there's, Plenty of ways to, to implement this, then. Those are all pretty interesting. The last mm-hmm. one is, like, really basic. If you want to throw a lot of the lore out, you put them in a dungeon. They're guarding something, and you make it a riddle. If they fail, then your party has to attack them and get a really hard fight instead of moving forward. Mm-hmm. Didn't that happen in White Plume Mountain? Mm-hmm. I think that's where you yeah, used your you Sphinx. Look. I don't think so. Yes. I used it. All right. I'm pretty sure. It literally in the PHB, there's a little like post-it note with a riddle from the Sphinx. Oh, yeah. And it says, Riddle of the Gino Sphinx of White Plume Mountain. Oh, okay. Then then sure. And the answer is the moon. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Oh, no. Nobody's going to remember that, I hope. I thought I used it when you guys went to the mummy in the, the Rin campaign. I thought I had the one. The one that killed Kevin's dude? Yeah, the mummy that killed mm-hmm. uh, Hadar. I can't remember if that was, you know, I don't Edwig. Know. No, Whatever. I think you did use a Sphinx there, too, with your own made-up riddle. It doesn't matter. None of this matters. I hate making up riddles, no, by the way. Uh, so if somebody... It's a bitch. If somebody has a good big book of riddles, I would take that so fast. Is there a D&D subreddit for making riddles? No, I don't think so. I'm going to check that yeah. out. I don't know right about a subreddit, but I'm sure there are communities dedicated to it. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yes, there is a... <laughs> it's just like a it, it's a very strange thing to base a community on making riddles yeah we're not sphinxes like <laughs> just people we are normal men putting forth riddles and puzzles and stuff like that people like that stuff one of the issues though yeah. when when i try and repurpose a riddle for D is very often the riddles will have like way too modern of a feeling to it where it's like the answer is a newspaper and i'm like well that doesn't really work for for D, or it's like a cell phone and it's like yeah that's definitely not gonna work so <laughs> it'd be so fucking pissed. right <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it almost feels like you you fall into these realms of ones that are so hard nobody's ever going to get them and ones that are so easy that you hear it and it's like yeah i've heard that a million times in in a different way yeah the, the uh, solvable easy riddles that people don't know they there's not a lot of them out there that's the surprisingly issue. Anyways, you guys want to talk about the stat block of this thing? I guess. No, I really like the riddles. <laughs> <laughs> so there's two of them, the Andrew Sphinx and the Gyno Sphinx. The, the, basically, it's the male and female variants of the Sphinxes. Uh, the Andrew Sphinx, we'll start with that, because it comes first in the book, because it's alphabetical. It's a, th- this thing is pretty tough. This would be a very tough fight. It's challenge rating 17. 199 hit points, 22 strength, 20 con, 23 charisma. Yeah, um, its lowest stat is dex at 10. It's immune to psychic damage and bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non magical attacks. Can't be charmed or frightened and has true sight. Um, it speaks Sphinx. Little sidebar. I just feel like that's like a really lazy thing to throw in there. That it's oh, we have two monsters here. They're Sphinxes. What do they speak? They speak Sphinx. 
Yeah, it's, I don't know. There's like why, why not make them speak celestial, common and celestial, or or even just ignore all language. languages. Yeah. yeah, they don't seem like the type who are going to be like you know you you have a party that centers themselves on not knowing common. Everyone speaks dwarvish, and then you get to the Sphinx, and they're like, oh, sorry, I only know common. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be so annoying. Yeah. I, I I don't see it. That, yeah, they speak all languages. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so they have an ability called in, not an ability, a passive feature called the scrutable they're immune to any effect that would sense its emotions or read its thoughts and any divination spells that it refuses and any insight checks are made a disadvantage which i think is very fitting role playing wise there you can't really use magic to get uh any sort of hints on their riddles and challenges to get you past it or anything like that right their attacks are magical their andro sphinx is a spell spellcaster 12th level dc of 18 and plus 10 to hit so it has up to six level spells some good ones in there. Yeah, there's some good ones. I think a lot of them are mainly flavor, it feels like yeah. to me. Like something like Detect Good and Evil is perfect for what you had mentioned, Kevin, of a, a test that requires you to be good. You just, that's it. That's the requirement. Maybe one of the parts of the test of seven. First one is you got to be good. All right, you pass that because it uses Detect Good and Evil. It's mostly flavor than anything. Look right here. It's got tongues. What's that? Huh? It's got the spell tongues. Oh, so, okay. Well, then just you just know. give it all languages. No. I mean, it's really not that important, but <laughs> no, it was it's just not. a little. It's a nitpick, though. Detect evil and good. It lets you know if there is an aberration slash you elemental fate <sighs> fiend or undead. It doesn't actually show alignment. Nothing really does that anymore. So it's just a yeah. terrible, terrible test. It's like, you're all good. And they're like, yeah, totally. <laughs> he's just, just not being a celestial <laughs> elemental fate fiend. Or he's undead. just bluffing. That's it. Yeah. No, you're totally right. I forgot about that. But as for spells that are worthwhile, uh, it does have Flame Strike, which is always a fun one. Uh, it just makes a giant column of fire and radiant damage. That's definitely going to get some use in combat. Mm-hmm. Sacred Flame cantrip. No, I'm just I'm thinking Sacred Flame. Do you think that would be more worthwhile than it using its claw attacks? Like it's, it, it's a ranged attack. It's okay. the only ranged attack it gets. Okay, that is worthwhile. Though. So 60 feet, yeah, deck save. Since it's a 12th level, it's a 3d8 cantrip, you know, decent. Yeah, what are you saying? Greater Restoration? Yes, Greater Restoration yeah. is good just to clear any effects it might have. I'm kind of surprised it doesn't have any legendary resistances. Hmm, yeah. It's like getting to that point where it doesn't have any, like, magical resistance. It doesn't have legendary resistances. The one thing that it has is just good saves in all of the important stuff. Plus 60 dex, plus 11 con, plus 9 int, and plus 10 wisdom. Uh, and even charisma's plus 6 saving throw. So mm -hmm. it's going to be hard to to put it under any effects, but once it's there, it's there. Right. Uh, it does have freedom of movement, which I think would be beneficial. So it has 60 foot fly speed. So I think if this thing fights, its maneuverability will be very beneficial to it. And freedom of movement stops it from getting locked down. But yeah, like, you could banish it. Yeah. You know, and if it's, these are, this is very much the type of enemy where you would probably fight it alone and it's not native to the material plane. So if you banish it, it's probably just, just gone. Just wait a minute, and then it's stuck on this plane. And Banishment's a charisma saving throw, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yep, charisma save. So that's, I mean, it only has plus six to that, which, I mean, is good. Don't get me wrong, but if, you, if you're if you fighting this, your spell save's going to be 17. I mean, just pulling a number out around there. It's not impossible for it to fail a 17 save DC, especially if you use things, other things. I mean, just there's ways to, to make that even easier to succeed. Right. So it's starting to seem like just like literally everything in Dungeons and Dragons 5e. It needs minions. It needs other things in this the combat. The issue is it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for it to have them. And this no. is one of those ones where when you encounter it, we, we went over this extensively. It's like one slot of sense for it to exist. And that is like the lone guardian yeah but it could have like stone golems that once combat yeah. start it's it it roars them to life you know i mean there's miscellaneous things you can throw in you could even make like a you know home homebrew is even the wrong word making a monster doesn't feel like homebrewing to me but that's the official term you just make a monster that is like a, a little uh, a little sphinx that's just like a, you know, a stone thing. Little that baby comes, sphinxes. Yeah, little baby sphinxes. And it just has the claw attack. You mean just like a regular ass lion? 
Yeah, no. like a lion cub. You get attacked mm. by lion cubs, then you got to slaughter them all. Lions that have like <laughs> magical attacks. That's it. And you know, whatever you want to do. Or just really any celestial creature. I can see you fight in and just they poof, pop into existence. Right. The god that put it here sends them down or whatever. Yeah, he's like, I understand the action economy. So when you get into trouble, you just <laughs> go ahead and let me know. <laughs> Fucking hate this game. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of uh, stuff like banishment, it's not officially in their stat block, but when you get to their layer actions, there's a lot of stuff in there about transporting people around, and also in their lore text saying like they're when issuing a challenge to overcome. It may teleport themselves and everybody who's involved in this to a top of the windswept mountain and they have to do something up there. So there's definitely kind of some groundwork laid for that. They're able to just sort of teleport amongst the planes rather easily. Oh, okay. It, it's Like I said, it's not in their stat block, but it, I, if we banish this thing and then the justification was, well, it's an extra planar entity. This is what it does. It just kind of comes back. I wouldn't be mad about it as a player. I'd understand. Yeah, maybe I wish it had plane shift. I feel like that would make it yeah. really solidified. For sure. Because I think that's a six level spell too. So I mean, I think so. It might be seventh level, but the Hero's Feast at six level is just kind of hanging out there. That's not a combat spell, obviously. Hero's no. Feast it is really helpful um, if you have it yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool flavor. It's maybe it's so excited to finally be talking to people they invite them in and before giving them the riddle to hero's feast and it will give them hero's feast if they solve the yeah. puzzle which is a great oh, okay. sometimes. yeah and i think that's really great midway through a dungeon uh is you just give everybody after this you pass this riddle that's kind of your reward to move forward in the dungeon instead of it you know giving you information it gives you a hero's feast yeah and it just so it's a six level spell slot if you you can take a, an hour to consume everything, and anyone who does it is the creature's cured of all diseases and poisons, becomes immune to poison and being frightened, and makes all wisdom saving throws with advantage. Its hit point maximum increases by 2d10s and gains the same number of hit points. This all lasts for 24 hours. So yeah, that's a very nice thing to get in the middle of a dungeon. Yeah, for sure. It's it's just like a frighteningly horrible player spell, because it's a thousand gold to cast. Oh, oh geez. I agree. Yeah, it takes... Takes 10 minutes, yeah. Six level. If it's something that, because it's probably like a, a druid or cleric spell, I feel like that's the thing that just. Druid and cleric. Oh, I just, I just guessed. Go me. Um, <laughs> Pretty easy guess. <laughs> uh, that seems like the type of thing that uh, you're going to only prepare on like the day before a big battle. You cast it at night and prepare everybody, and then the effects last for 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. It, it would it would really really have to be one of those situations. Like I would definitely give players a big bonus if they had NPCs that they brought in on this. Like the final sure. fight uh, in Tyranny of yeah. Dragons, which was an unsolvable mess. But if you had like Heroes Feast, which you wouldn't, because you were too low level to have this critical. No, spell. you were fourteenth level at the end of that. Were yeah. you? Yeah, something like I can't that. Remember. I just remember they said if you use Earthquake, you get a bonus, and you could not have had Earthquake. That sounds <laughs> but, right. Yeah, so if you if you do have this spell, you know, you give it to your NPCs, they do slightly better in the fight. Sure. Or whatever. All right, moving on to the actual action. So it has multi-attack, makes two claw attacks, not much to this. It's plus 12 to hit, and 2d10 plus 6 slashing damage. So it's high to hit, not crazy damage for the level, but it's not terrible. I mean... No, that'll whittle somebody down. Yeah, what's really cool though is then the roar, and so this is its own action. They can't do this and the claw. They get three roars a day. Every time they do it, it upgrades to be louder and louder with a new effect. Um, it impacts any creature within 500 feet that's able to hear the roar. The first roar, it's a DC 18 wisdom save, and then they're frightened for one minute. You can repeat the save at the end of each of its turns. The second roar is another DC 18 wisdom save, and they're deafened and frightened, and a creature that's frightened by this becomes paralyzed which gets scary and they repeat the same throw and then the third roar is a dc 18 con save and a failed save they take 8d10 thunder damage and are knocked prone half as much on a success and not knocked prone so i like that kind of upgrading updating you know step-by-step style of it but this is another thing where if they are just there alone you're kind of wasting through some turns this really needs to benefit from having other stuff around i think 
And that's that's fair to some extent. I think the legendary actions make up for it a bit. That's true. Yeah. Because yeah, you're yeah. you're not just and one of their legendary actions, which I guess we can get into now, is uh casting a spell. Uh, so that takes all of their legendary actions for that round. But if their entire turn, uh, like for an, a round, is to use one of their roars and also use flame strike, I don't think you're going to be missing out on what you could have done instead. That's a pretty substantial turn. Otherwise, they do get their claw, which they can make three times throughout the round, uh, which is pretty good damage as we already discussed. And they can also mm-hmm. teleport for two actions, uh, which just gives them great battlefield arrangement. They can teleport away and then use their roar super far away. Cause it's like a 500 foot radius. And then for people who fail, they're going to be nowhere near. It's going to be very difficult for them to attack uh, unless they have something that's crazy long range. This is definitely a creature that because of all of these benefits from being in a very wide open area mm-hmm. you can also it, it, i mean we'll probably go into it a little bit more but you it is one of the few creatures that can very consistently get its initiative above the other people in the dungeons initiative why do you say that you it can make everybody re-roll initiative and keep its result Oh, right, 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 right. So an initiative is always gets 20. So layer actions usually go first. So right. Forgot all about the layer actions. Those are pretty important. Yeah, th- these are huge. But yeah, it can the, the roars are a little tough, but you can kind of get that working with that. Approach. But to your point, Kevin, on the roars, I, I agree. I totally love these abilities, and I would like to see more things like this. I think it it follows along in uh, the the boss style that Matt Coville has talked about, uh, where it's set things that happen on you know first round, second round, third round uh, that aren't really actions or things that the the creature just normally does. It's just like things get progressively harder because that's what bosses do. Bosses have different phases. They have things that are outside of what PCs can do. Uh, And I think this kind of fits in that realm that I, I do like just the increasing difficulty. And it's just interesting. You're not having the same roar happen every time, which is right. Very literal, but it's just, that's fun in a fight. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, so the Gyno Sphinx, it's very similar to the Andro Sphinx. Blank down the name for a second, even though we were just talking about it. It's just kind of a weaker version. The Gyno Sphinx is good if you want to use a Sphinx on a lower level party. That's kind of the main reason I can see the difference. This is a challenge rating 11, 136 hit points, 17 AC, um, resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks. So it's not immune. Uh, it is immune to psychic. Still has the inscrutable, still has magic weapons, still spellcasting as a ninth level spellcaster. DC 16 plus 8 to hit. No real damaging spells. Yeah, that's my biggest issue. It doesn't even have a damage cantrip like the Andrew Sphinx no. did. Right. Yeah, Mage Hand, Minor Illusion, and Prestidigitation, which are not really great spells. Well, I, I was going to say, not really great spells for non PCs, but I. The, again, for a, for a monster stat block, these are definitely types where they're going to be more NPCs than monsters where you're talking with them and interacting. and Right. You, you could get make use of those. I think what it does get, though, it gets darkness, which is definitely good. Uh, it gets greater invisibility, which the Andro Sphinx does not get. Oh, true. Yeah. And I guess that's it's really the only combat one. Suggestion. I mean, not combat, but... Suggestion. It, it seems r- rare that there's the opportunity for the DM to use suggestion on the players. Yeah. That would be... I never really thought about that. That would be kind of tricky to play out. You would need the person to really kind of dedicate to the role playing of it. Right. N- now, the one thing that I... That the Andrew Sphinx has and the, the Gyna Sphinx that we didn't talk about is Banishment. Um, and Banishment is one of those spells that I find very difficult to use as a DM because it just removes somebody from combat for a whole minute. But on the other hand, it does make a very big focus on breaking concentration as quickly as possible. Right. So that is really a combat spell and can be very deadly to the party, especially because it can be upcast to fifth level. And now you're banishing two out of four party members and you've got two people left and... Boy, I sure hope it's not the cleric who can only do 
you know, 2d8 damage a turn because we need to break that concentration as quickly as possible. Right. Definitely. Also gets shield. Yep. Which is just nice. Yeah. Same as the Andrew Sphinx. It's just useful. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, this one kind of also goes along with what the Andrew Sphinx had and these can almost be used as a excuse to do spells as a service as a dungeon master. So say like your party's level like six and they need legend lore cast like mm. desperately. Who in the kingdom knows legend lore? It's like probably almost nobody. But if there is a local Sphinx who, you know, I don't know, likes magic gem encrusted bowls or something. She could be like, yeah, you bring me a really, really fancy bowl, I'll cast Legend Lore and tell you that information. I think that's not a bad approach to go with with the giant Sphinx. Yeah, and I I wonder for the Sphinxes, uh, using that type of hook, what do Sphinxes want? Because it seems to me that their entire purpose is to guard information. So you saying that they want gem-encrusted bowls, something about that doesn't sit right with me. It seems like they wouldn't really care about material goods. So... Maybe they need information too. You know, they want you to go somebody somewhere and bring them some lost lore uh, that they can't leave their post for for whatever reason. What do, I mean? What are some other things that sphinxes might want though? Or they might just want you to prove yourself. No different than sure. They may not treat it any different than the specific piece of lore or treasure they were sent there to protect. It's like okay, it's not that, but you know, I'm a sphinx. So I want you to prove yourself. And here's a lesser challenge. That's my thing. That's that's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure we can't just give you like 10,000 gold? We've got plenty. And it's like, nope, pass my test. Yeah, they, they really aren't the kind of thing with like material wants outside of maybe irrational. Like you, you can do that with anything you want as a DM. I think they're a good fit for this Gino Sphinx likes very fancy bowls. Sure. As a player, I wouldn't fight it too much. As a DM, I'd be like, no, Jared, you can be more creative than that. Fancy cups. I don't know. Oh, okay. Now it's better. Yeah, I like that. Remember those Burger King Disney cups? (laughs) (laughs) For me, it was always the the Pokemon jam jars. Do you remember those? Those are classic. And they also had Lion King ones. We we got a lot of those. So, yeah, if I was a Sphinx, that's what I'd want. (laughs) The Gino Sphinx wants all 151 Pokemon Gino <laughs> I don't think there were that many, but... Well, fuck it. We got a fighter, I guess. <laughs> or we need to make all 151. <laughs> all right. It's actions. It has multi-attack, two claw attacks, plus eight to hit, two day, plus four slashing damage. And the- That's it in terms of actions. No roar. Yeah, I wish it had a mini roar. No, nothing. I would have really liked that. Yeah, or just something else I could do. All right. I might be being a dummy. Can female lions, like, roar, roar, or can they just make cat noises? No idea. Yeah, I wouldn't know. More importantly, are we really basing this on actual female lions? Because aren't... I mean, they clearly yeah, did. No, I get that, know. but aren't... <laughs> no, I'm saying from a biological standpoint, because aren't female lions, like, the hunters, and yet this one does less damage than the male one? It's not because they're yeah. stronger. It's because the male ones are just lazy. Okay, well, the, science. Is I want that. The male ones are vastly stronger, but they just don't. Well, like I want that things. reflected in the stat block somehow. <laughs> <laughs> he can make three attacks per turn. Usually, only does one. <laughs> <laughs> I would take that. All right, so that brings us to layer actions uh, as their their final thing yeah. here. Well, the Gano Sphinx does have legendary actions. They're um, all the same. The identical. Yeah. yeah, identical. So, Sorry, I thought I already said cool. that. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Keep it together, Jared. No. <laughs> Loose and sloppy. That's what our podcast is all about. <laughs> Those specific adjectives. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Layer actions, though. Take it away, Kevin. So lay- these layer actions work the same Actually, not quite. I was about to say they work the same as all others, but they don't. So most layer actions, they'll say, on an issue count 20, they could pick one of these effects to happen within their layer, and you have to use all of them before using 
one again. That's usually how it goes. These ones say they cannot be used again until the Sphinx takes a shorter long rest. Um, I kind of like this a little better because it's made them a lot more powerful, knowing every one of these is a one-time effect. Sometimes layer actions feel a little weak. These ones don't. So on initial count 20, they could do one of the following things, and they were once per battle, basically. So they could alter the flow of time, um, such that every creature in the layer must reroll initiative. The Sphinx can choose not to reroll if they want. Very powerful. That's cool. Like, I, I don't know anything like that. No. No, and, and again, it's extremely useful. I can't tell you how many times I've had a boss fight that kind of fell flat because the the boss ended up with a, a two on their initiative roll. And it just kind of sucks the wind out of a lot of it uh, as you guys get to come in and deal 150 damage before he even gets to, to start their turn. I mean, it, it seriously, it, it sucks. So just being able to do that right from the start, because you can do that right. literally at the start. You roll it, you go, oh, yeah, Initiative crap. count 20. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, crap, my, my Sphinx rolled a, a 7 and everybody else rolled a 22. Well, re-roll it, everybody. And just the collective groans across the table would give me so much joy. <laughs> uh, next action, the effects of time. The effects of time are altered such that every creature in the layer must succeed on a 15 con save or become 1d20 years older or younger. The Sphinx's choice, never younger than one year old, a greater restoration spell could restore them to their normal age. Interesting is what I yeah. have to say for that one. I could see making people younger a lot better than older, uh, just because most adventurers seem to fit into that like 20-ish range, except for except for when you have something like an elf or a furbolg or a dwarf or any race that lives like 700 years. This is right. going to fall so flat. And I know that because in a game I was running the other day, I, they were fighting ghosts or ghosts some yeah i think ghosts and they have a thing where you will age like 20 years and the only person who was failing the con saving throw enough for that to trigger was an elf so it was like oh you go from 150 to 170 and they were like okay so that doesn't change anything i'm like yeah okay yeah it doesn't change anything let's let's move on right like, this could have been really yeah. cool yeah so that's one where it very much depends on the race of the character um Definitely younger, you know, if, you, if you're a human or a tabaxi or something like that, and you make them 20, I mean, they could end up being toddlers. Right. I mean, they could be literal babies. Right. <laughs> they could go down to but one year old. rules is written, no stat changes. <laughs> yeah, and that was what I was going to bring up next, is the fact that it really shouldn't matter stat-wise. I think there's only one spell, and I don't remember which one it is right now, uh, that ages you and puts you like 30 days to death or something, and that has mechanical implications. Yeah, that's a new one within um, the Wild Mount book. That was one of the Dunamancy spells in there. Was it? Okay. Yeah, it's like a high level, like eighth or ninth level spell. Yeah, okay. it makes someone 38 days from death, and they have half their movement and disadvantage and everything. Right. So I, I don't know yeah. if I want to say, like, there's part of me that's like, oh, yeah, it would be cool if there was rules around what different ages gave you different me mechanical debilitations or boosts but like geez it's not fun i want to play and it, it, it's not a new concept and there's a reason it's not right there. like i want to play the 80 year old wizard who's on death's door but is still kicking ass you know i don't i don't want to have right. to take maybe i can set that up where i have a, con a low constitution because i'm older but like don't i don't think we need mechanics around that Right, yeah, so for that, if you have a character that ends up really young, you, you just kind of, up to DM discretion, just sort of work out how that would happen. Right. If you're a fighter, and you have a great sword, and you're now three years old, it's like, I would pretty much rule it as if like they were half or gnome, where they can't even wield the heavy weapons. <laughs> I would rule it as you're a three-year-old, right. and you should right. go to school or something. <laughs> yeah. And if you really want to have fun, though, like every time they go into the guards, stop them, and they have a long, like, TSA-style conversation about why a bunch of gruff adventurers are running around with a... <laughs> with who's carrying a sword behind it. Right. But if you're, like a, like, a sorcerer where their magic is just an innate talent, you might still let them cast their spells. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, in the other direction, of like, say, like, a turtles. They only live, I think, 50 years. So I, I could see, like, yeah, you have a turtle who's 35, which is wouldn't be that weird, and they'd still be prime adventure in age, and then they get hit with this, and they're now 48. Right. 
you know. And maybe if you say the only thing I could see is then like up to DM discretion. Maybe you want to say like, oh, you know, you you got aged 40 years and now you're super old. And because of that, you drop three on the initiative count. So you had a 17. Now it's a 14 because you're a little bit slower. And it's like, I'm not going to affect anything else. It's going to be a one time effect uh, because anything more is going to be overly punishing. You know, if you tried to say, oh, your dexterity drops to four. It's like, eh, well, screw you. That ruins my character for this entire fight. Right. And you can also just leave it psychological. Yeah. Which I almost feel like is and the And that's fine. Here. It's like, 1d20 years, I don't think, that would upset me personally. You know, if I rolled a one, I probably wouldn't even notice, right. but. You think, oh, my back doesn't hurt as much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the character, yeah, a lot of people just aren't going to give a shit, so I don't know. It's interesting, yes. though. Yeah. And it, and the Sphinx can fix it. So Right. You know. I say, and then it's just restored from a greater restoration spell. So I think, in my eyes, the point of this is you drop a 20-year-old to a 8-year-old, and then they can't really fight until you use a greater restoration spell on them. Right. All right. Uh, next effect, the flow of time within the layer is altered such that everything within moves up 10 years forward or backwards, the Sphinx's choice. Only the Sphinx is aware of this change, and only a wish spell can return the creatures to their original time. So this is one that I think that DMs might mistake for something to actually use in combat. It is not. This is purely something no. for story reasons that you mm-hmm. put together a reason why the characters need to go back 10 years and then they have to go to a Sphinx. It's, it's a plot hook. It is not supposed to be a, oh, 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 let's move things 10 years forward so that all of their plans fail. No, that's stupid. Yeah. Um, or punishment. That this is the Sphinx versions of punishment. They don't want to just kill people. They move you forward 10 years in advance and set you back yeah but like that sucks that could really suck yeah like think of it depends on the campaign our current campaign like i mean it would suck but it wouldn't end the campaign you know because we're not dealing with like world ending threats or anything like that it's like everyone's personal quests would obviously be very set back and much more difficult so it'd be a strong punishment right but we could still play and it would add more interesting shit to deal with and that's fair that's fair um i would hate it because i'd have to come up with where everything is in 10 years (laughs) Right, yeah. And that's way too much work. <laughs> so maybe I do like one year. One year. I could deal with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the final one, uh, the Sphinx shifts itself and up to seven other creatures it can see within its layer to another plane of existence. Once inside its layer, it can't use its layer actions, but it can return to its layer as a bonus action on its turn, taking up seven creatures with it. So earlier when we were talking about getting over banishment, this is kind of part of the reason why you might just let them do that. Yeah. Getting past it. Yeah. But this is another one where it's not so much common. Well, I guess it could be. Yeah, if you were banished, I could totally see them using this to get themselves yeah. back. Or even funnier, bringing them all to you. Yeah. <laughs> or, <laughs> well, you wouldn't be in their layer, its true. layer anymore. That's but true. you do this and you, you teleport. You take two of the party members with you. And then on your turn, bonus action back, leaving the two party members there. And you split the party and it's easier to manage. <laughs> You also can create a situation where, like, uh, it doesn't really say as much, but the Sphinx can almost kind of bargain in a way if it doesn't want to fight the players. So, like, if you shift all the players somewhere mm. else, they are very low on options. Right. The Sphinx has to, like, take right, them back. Right, right. It's like, hey, we're on another plane of existence, so will you guys leave me alone? Because otherwise, you're staying here. Are you going to solve the riddle right. or not? <laughs> As they're like toasted alive in the elemental plane right. of fire. Right. Is there an elemental plane of psychic damage? <laughs> Is there immune to it? Uh, sure. The elemental plane of mundane bludgeoning damage. Mundane bludgeoning damage. Mundane bludgeoning damage. I love it. Yeah. Just like. Because they're also immune. Just like wooden planks just come and just kind of hit you. Like it hurts. Right. There's just. Thousands of rakes, millions of rakes, <laughs> infinite plane of rakes just lying Everywhere you step, whack, whack. <laughs> DC fucking 60 decks to avoid stepping on another rake. Perfect. But yeah, that's, that's the final layer action and everything about the Sphinxes. Yeah, 
And that's, there's a lot about Sphinxes. I'm actually kind of happy sure. with how that turned out. There's a, it, it can feel like a kind of weak setup, but I, I think the, the lore does give plenty for you to make into hooks. Mm-hmm. No, these are actually, I love these monsters, and they're just, they're not unique in any way. It's just D&D mechanics on top of the mythological version of the right. Sphinx. So mm-hmm. I, I personally like archetypes like that. That's fair. You're allowed to like dumb stuff. <laughs> Imagine being wrong. I will say that it, it does have at least the interesting mechanic of the roar, the Andro Sphinx, and the layer actions are pretty unique. So it's not entirely mundane. It's stat block at like a surface level. Yeah, it's it's pretty basic stuff. Um, but I think there's it throws in some twists. Right, especially with the layer actions. And I can't see why you would fight this thing outside of its layer. DM mistake. Just not not <laughs> random and not counter. listening. Oh, look a Sphinx kid. Right. <laughs> that's that's what happens when you don't listen to monsters in multiclass. You throw in exactly. just random Sphinx as as just travel encounters. <laughs> oh, okay, that actually would be kind of funny though. Now I'm imagining just you guys just walking along the the Great Plains and out of nowhere a Sphinx swoops down and it's just like, You must answer my riddle or I will kill you. It's like what why are you here? <laughs> Listen, man, my lair, it's too hidden. No, I fucked up. Nobody finds it. It's really frustrating. So, Alternatively, if you help me advertise my lair, I'll <laughs> let you go. And you can have a free feast. <laughs> I take that. The gang becomes marketers. And this little Sphinx bobblehead that I have 10,000 of. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we're good to move on to our final segment of Ask Monsters in Multiclass. I would agree. All right, so for this question of Ask Monsters in Multiclass, what a weird way to phrase that. This time on Ask Monsters in Multiclass, I don't love it, but let's move on. Izunagi3 on Twitter asked, when would you use the Artificer's Protector Cannon over the other two options? Uh, The other two options being the Eldritch Cannon that the Artillerist Artificer gets, and I believe it's the flamethrower and the force ballista Mm -hmm. so the force ballista so when you create these cannons you can activate them as a bonus action uh you get one free one per day and then you can expend spell slots to bring other ones they last an hour ac of 18 so that's the type of thing you're expected to have a lot of but you can only only have one at a time until much much higher levels the force ballista is 120 foot range and has a bonus action chart Make it fire and deal 2d8 force damage. Um, and the creatures push five feet away from the cannon and you make a ranged spell attack. Flamethrower creates a 15 foot cone origin- originating from the cannon. Each carry area within it makes a spell save. Yes, a deck save against your spell DC, taking 2d8 fire damage on a failed half as much on success. And the protector is emits a burst of positive energy that grants itself. And each creature of your choice within 10 of at a number of temporary hit points equal to 1d8 plus your intelligence modifier. So that's actually pretty good because it's a bonus action to just continue to reapply it. Right. Right. That That's, yeah, it's not a one-time thing. So every single turn you could reapply 1d8 plus your intelligence modifier hit points to any creature of your choice within 10 feet of this cannon. This really lends itself well to damage that's spread out if you've got a party if like say let's say you have four people and they're in a 10 foot square all taking fairly numerous low damage attacks and you have this cannon you've now essentially neutralized the entire damage uh situation yeah and definitely a benefit there and say uh will i think before we started recording you said that the uh the scaling of it just isn't too great and I don't know if I fully agree with that. It takes until ninth level to make it 2d8 instead of 1d8. And that seems pretty worthwhile to me at, at ninth level, getting 2d8 plus your intelligence modifier and temp HP every single round. That doesn't happen at ninth. Oh, that one doesn't scale? It says the cannon's damage rolls all increase by 1d8. I guess I figured that that was included. Is it not? I don't know. It's not it's damage. It's called explosive cannon. So, I mean, one of these things is not very... It also says every Eldritch Cannon you create is more destructive. The point of it is it's like the the action to command it to blow up. (laughs) 
And I no, this actually is even worse. It does one d eight healing and temp HP and one d eight damage, force damage. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a really bad design flaw of the cannon itself. Okay, man, that's this is gonna bother me. I I guess I don't know if that should scale. <laughs> I don't know. It's not that good. Like it's not like if it did two d eight of temp HP. That that at ninth level in particular is pretty damn good. But that's it. And higher level encounters start like nuking things pretty fast with big hit. I don't know. I can, it just it's like what we talked about earlier when you have something like this one it's not a limit on the number of creatures that can impact it's when you have a large number of creatures keep in mind it's the a, limit it's is 10 feet within 10 feet of the cannon so it's really a 40 foot cube basically right yeah or 20 10 feet in each direction yes 20 feet cube yeah and it protects itself um at 15th level when you could have two of them that could also, I guess, yeah, I think be that's, that's the answer to this question. Is it makes a good compliment? Yeah, the protector protects the other cannon. Oh, they can protect each other then. Hmm. Well, no, oh. they don't have to be two of the same cannon. Oh, okay. So you make one protector and one of whatever other cannon that's actually doing damage, and that right. Okay, that actually makes a lot of sense. At fifteenth level, it seems to make, be a lot more useful. For what it's worth, I did look up. Uh, at least some discussions on it really quick. It looks like the general consensus is no, it does not get the extra 1d8 that is only for the Force Ballista and Flamethrower. Hmm. So, bit of a bummer there. I guess I don't get why they didn't make that 2d8. That seems kind of silly in my opinion. Yeah, I've noticed a really common thread throughout just all of 5e's design is a temp hit points are always kept really low. There's a uh, not a lot that could put a lot of temp hit points out there. It just seems to be this fear of, with the exception of like the Spore Druids thing, but their entire class is built around it. And Armor of Agathis. I say those yeah. those two. That's still, that's 25, you know. That's kind of a lot. I guess in, you know, when we're talking yeah. about a potential of 13 versus 25 for, I mean, a fifth level spell, that's that's a huge cost. So I guess I take that back a little. Yeah, no, I think that does seem to be accurate. They're They're worried about temp HP. So my question then is not, I I don't know, it's more just like a a very large design question of like, why didn't they just make it healing? But maybe that's too powerful because then that just, that is That would be so fucking broken. No, you're right. You're right. That would be the most broken thing. (laughs) You're right. If that had come up, that would have been all we talked about with the Artificer. (laughs) Is how this is the greatest healing class that's ever existed in human history. (laughs) This makes the spirit guardian walkie weird chain thing look like a joke. I mean, there are ways to, <laughs> to stop it from being so powerful. Maybe it can only affect one creature, then it's not crazy, or... It blows up after five uses, sure. and then it's stupid. It, it blows yeah. up, but it specifically uses the explosive cannon blow up, so it, you can't just... At, yeah, at level nine, it can get worse. <laughs> <laughs> Better not... Why do you design things like this? It's like, I don't know, I can't help myself. <laughs> You know, I would say even if you have one person that's getting hit a bunch, giving them 1d8 plus your intelligence modifier every single round as a bonus action could be useful. Like, if, if every round they get hit enough to blow through that, it's essentially healing. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah. And so, let's say they get hit for 20 damage in a round, but they had this on them. So, and you're in, yeah, it's your plus your intelligence. So, it's going to be decent. It's going to be plus three, plus four. So what's that? What's that average out to nine, nine or ten? So you t- get twenty damage dealt. You really only take ten. Next round, you get twenty damage dealt. You really only take ten. I mean, it's literally having your damage in that sense. It's like when you really need to keep someone alive. Yeah, no, that's fair. And I think there's also the obvious thing of flavor wise. It might be more fitting to what you want to do. If you're playing the Artificer who's going for more the Protector route than you are for the pure blow em up do damage route, uh, I think this gives the Artillerist a more, uh, what's the word, a support option. And that's I just like that as a whole. The fact that the Artillerist isn't solely focused on blow stuff up, even though their name kind of right. implies that. <laughs> right. <laughs> This is one of those situations that it kind of depends on party comp. If everybody is like a ranged focused or mobility focused character who runs like 
to the corners of whatever the DM drew <laughs> to do whatever they want. This is not going to work right. very well. If you've got a monk, a barbarian, and a champion fighter, and you're fighting one slow-moving enemy, like you're going to look like a, a jabroni trying to do the force ballast. You might as well just be the Yeah, Neil that's bot. a good point. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, if you have a escort quest. Okay, sure. They have this follow the whoever you're escorting around, whoever you need to keep safe. Yeah, yeah. When, when it goes beyond just doing damage. We should have one of those. We should do an escort quest soon. You guys want to do an escort quest? They're a lot more fun in fantasy role-playing games where there aren't technical mechanics like a video game. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That'd be really frustrating if the DM's like, oh, man, this is crazy. Uh, the guy you're escorting? Stuck behind a barrel. <laughs> Can't move him. He's just or even stuck worse, the, He's like clipping into the it. escort mission where the NPCs walk just a little bit slower than you do. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Yep, let me just walk right behind you. Just every two seconds, kind of take forward. You make us play that out. Once we're back to doing in-game sessions, we have to follow you around, like walk in a circle in the basement. <laughs> we need to just keep up with you for 20 minutes. <laughs> and you just walk at an uncomfortable, awkward pace. And just randomly get clipped See, on walls. This fucking emergency yeah. <laughs> Just clip on walls every once in a while where I just like kind of stagger for a second. You guys have to like move far enough away that I like reset. Yes, this is what you want. Make D&D more like a video game. Any of your pets show up, you just immediately die. And it's like, oh, <laughs> perfect. So I think that's everything around this. I think there are some times, most of the time, you are going to lean towards that Force Ballista or the Flamethrower. The Flamethrower, yeah. yeah. Where mitigate the damage by just killing them quicker. Right. <laughs> but there's there's options. There's reasons. And yeah. the fact that the option yeah. is there makes it sometimes worthwhile taking, you know, just to to play the character differently and not just go for the straight optimized explosions or it's a protector quest and you need the health or you're better off just serving your barbarian because god damn does he put out more damage than 2d8 in one round if he's still up. Right. Uh, but that's all for this episode, I believe. Anything, any final thoughts on anything? You guys, this is your guys' platform. It's totally open. Anything you want to say, now is the time. No, I'm good. <laughs> Not got nothing. Jared? One time when I was seven, uh, I got into a rather large fight with a, another kid at school. Um, he promised me that uh, if I decoded all of the the uno or unknown sorry not uno that's the card game uh all of the unknown in uh pokemon gold and silver for him then he would uh he'd pay me five dollars and he never paid me those five dollars <laughs> what's with kids in pokemon I don't know. dude when my brother went to the wreck for like a pokemon trading game he traded uh one of our machamps which came with the starter <laughs> set so we had yeah. a ton of those. He traded our holographic Machamp for a Polyrath, which was a pretty yeah. rare card. Guess what? Polyrath was in a protective sheath. It had gone through a washing machine. Oh, kid ran my off. God, that's rough. Ruined, ruined yeah. Polyrath. Little bastard. <laughs> Never caught him. <laughs> Anyways, Kevin, you want to say the the thing? Thanks for listening. <laughs> Next time on Monsters and Multiple. Join us as we discuss the Paladin Ranger and Liches from the Monster Manual with a special guest, Horamir, from Twitter. He doesn't have a podcast, I don't think, um, but he's a cool guy. He's going to be on our show to talk mechanics and stuff. Mm-hmm.